This video is sponsored by War Thunder. War Thunder is a realistic free-to-play military vehicle combat game. It's available on PC, PS5, Xbox Series X, and previous generations of consoles as well, but probably not your Sega Mega Drive. Definitely not. It has to be somewhat modern. It means like the previous generation to the current generation. Don't get any crazy, crazy ideas. There's no need to purchase anything you just download and play. In this game, there are more than 2,000 historically accurate tanks, helicopters, ships, and other vehicles spanning the entire 20th century. They're all carefully built and incredibly detailed, operating in a realistic physics engine. It's an immersive gaming experience with real historical campaigns. Even the sound is, the sound is great. Like, I put a big pair of headphones on, and it's an experience. I realize video games have come some way. It's a lot of fun. And look, you could just jump in for a quick arcade game, which is great if you're pressed for time or just looking for something casual. I love this quick, easy, casual option. I I'm a busy dude. Like, I don't have time to, like, get super into every aspect of a video game. I like to fire it up for, like, 20 minutes, have a little battle, and then get on with the rest of my day because i got to do. But also, if you have lots of time, like Simon from 10 years ago, <laughs> student Simon, he'd be like, yeah, 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 I can, sp I can spend like the entire day playing this. And then you can get really good at it, which is nice. For me now, just play that quick arcade mode. Easy, fun, simple. Right now, War Thunder is inviting all of my viewers to join its 50 million plus worldwide players on the battlefield. Good lord, that's a lot of players. For free, yes, costs you not a dime. And guess what? Guess what? For all of you that do jump in using my link, it's below, by the way, War Thunder will give you a free premium tank, aircraft, or ship, plus three days of premium time for free. Yes, yes, very cool deal. Thank you, War Thunder. And now back to today's video. Between the late 1950s and the mid-1970s, the Soviet Union produced approximately 90,000 T-54, 55, and T-62 main battle tanks for domestic use. By comparison, between 1960 and 1983, Chrysler produced just 15,000 M-60 tanks at the Detroit Arsenal tank plant. Featuring lower profiles, simple designs, and lethal high-velocity guns, the Soviet machines were generally less expensive and easier to manufacture than their Western counterparts. Depending on the variant and the equipment, Soviet tanks typically cost less than two million US dollars in today's money, while each M60 cost nearly twice as much. By the mid-1960s, American M60s and German Leopard 1s made up the bulk of the armored force that would be expected to counter the Soviets if all hell broke loose. Armed with 105mm rifled cannons derived from the Royal Ordnance L7, both had fared with Israeli forces in the Middle East, but the next generation of Soviet tanks had thicker armor and new 115mm smoothbore cannons with longer ranges and better penetrating power. It was completely assumed that Western tanks were technologically superior and that this alone would negate Soviet numerical responsibility. But this may have been wishful thinking on the part of NATO countries. In the event of war involving huge formations of main battle tanks thundering towards one another across the plains of Western Europe, many Soviet armored vehicles would have been just as capable as their rivals and in some respects even superior. Not surprisingly, developing a new main battle tank was a priority in the West, but rather than going it alone, the United States and West Germany teamed up to develop a game-changing super tank the MBT-70. Tipping the scales at about 54 tons, that's 49,000 kilograms, featuring a revolutionary pneumatic suspension system and a whopping 152mm dual-purpose cannon-slash-missile launcher, the MBT-70 was a huge divergence from tank designs of the day. In addition to having the lowest silhouette of any contemporary tank, the entire three-man crew resided inside the large, flat turret to improve efficiency and survivability. During the early going, the MBT-70 looked like a world-beater, and it might have swayed the outcome of any battle that it had gone into. Except that it never went into battle, nor was any production unit ever manufactured, largely because America and Germany couldn't agree on guns, engines, track suspensions, armor, or fire control systems, let alone whether the tank's thousands of nuts, bolts, and screw nuts would be imperial or metric. And now, entering into the picture, is Robert McNamara.
Shortly after the Second World War, Ford Motor Company president Henry Ford II hired McNamara and a small cadre of Army Air Force veterans to transform the company his grandfather founded into a leaner, more efficient, and more profitable enterprise. The group largely succeeded by implementing a number of new, controversial, and largely unpopular systems and programs, and as a result, McNamara himself later became the company's president. However, he wasn't particularly well liked by the rank and file employees, particularly the engineers. They, and pretty much everybody else, saw him as an insufferable micromanager and shameless penny pincher whose main objectives were reducing costs and speeding development times, often at the expense of sound engineering principles and, well, good old-fashioned common sense. Later, as U.S. Secretary of Defense in the 1960s, McNamara applied these same methods to the development and procurement of military equipment in America, often with less than favorable results, as was the case with the McDonnell Douglas F-111. According to McNamara, another glaring problem in dire need of a solution was that various NATO nations fielded hundreds of different weapons systems, nearly all of which lacked common designs, parts, and ammunition. This meant that huge amounts of time and money were being wasted developing similar systems that would be used by allies for nearly identical purposes, all of which added up to gobs of waste, inefficiency, and redundancy, three things that drove the ex-auto executive nuts. For much of the 1950s, West Germany had grudgingly used American M48 patterns, but the country's military was intent on building its own indigenous main battle tanks. McNamara considered Germany a key NATO ally as well as an engineering powerhouse, and he theorized that joint development on such an important project would reduce cost, decrease development time, and produce a better vehicle than each country would be capable of developing on its own. Though they'd been in service for less than a decade, the army was already itching to replace its M60, so the timing could not have been better. Detractors claimed that after the Second World War, German engineering had failed to keep pace with developments in Britain and America, and that the program would result in a huge one-way transfer of technology out of the United States. Hence, if an MBT was to be co-developed, England would be a far more suitable partner. McNamara countered that Germany was in a better financial position to take on the project, and that geographically speaking, the country was literally on the front line of the Cold War, whereas Britain was an island nation buffeted by Western European countries and the English Channel. As a result, it made sense that Germany had more incentive to develop the new MBT, since its very survival might someday depend on it. In August of 1963, the United United States and Germany signed a Memorandum of Understanding to develop this new tank. Former tank commander General Wellborn G. Dolvin was tasked with leading a team of engineers from U.S. automakers Chrysler, GM, and Ford, while in Germany a semi-private development corporation was formed to oversee the project. To ensure that each team had adequate input, it was decided that the first phase of development would take place in Germany, after which everyone would pack up and move to the United States. Ironically, when in Germany, the Americans would manage the project and the roles would be reversed when the Germans were in America. And as they say, what could possibly go wrong with that? From the outset, the MBT-70 was designed to incorporate the best mix of firepower, mobility, and protection. American versions were originally to be powered by gas turbines, similar to the ones now used in Abrams tanks, but in addition to having alarmingly high fuel consumption, engineers found it nearly impossible to filter the air adequately before it was sucked into the engine. As a result, it was decided that diesels were more suitable despite their increased size and weight. German tanks would use 1,500 horsepower Daimler Benz and later MTU turbo diesel engines, while the Americans would opt for a Chrysler V12 producing about 1,470 horsepower. Power was sent through a rank 8 speed transmission, and with an internal fuel volume of about 345 US gallons, or 1,300 liters, operational range was approximately 400 miles, or 645 kilometers. On both German and American tanks, drivetrains could be replaced in less than an hour, largely because engines and transmissions were housed in compartmentalized power packs located at the rear of the hull behind the turret. But perhaps the most notable feature was the tank's hydropneumatic suspension system, which to together with an exceptionally high power-to-weight ratio, gave the 50-plus-ton machines unparalleled cross-country mobility. 
This complex system also gave the MBT-70s hull-down capabilities that allowed them a much wider range of fire on the vertical plane. On an incline, when the back of the tank was sitting lower than the front, the rear suspension could be raised to allow the gun to press farther to fire at targets below it. This design feature allowed the MBT-70s to fire from behind hilltops, ridges, and man-made defensive positions without exposing most of the tank. Regardless of terrain or firing position, the suspension could be raised or lowered by the driver. During cross-country maneuvers, tanks could be raised more than two feet, that's 61 centimeters, to improve ground clearance, and in stationary firing positions, they could be lowered until the bottoms of the holes were just four inches or 10 centimeters off the ground. Had they not had such revolutionary suspensions, MBT-70s would still have been among the lowest turreted tanks ever built, especially in comparison to the M60, which was one of the tallest. With their suspensions in the lowest possible position, MBT-70s were just over six feet or 1.8 meters tall. To put this in perspective, Germany's turretless Hetzer tank destroyers of World War II were slightly more than 7 feet tall, and M60s were nearly 11 feet tall. Though this made the MBT-70s difficult targets, it left no room for drivers in the hull. Instead, drivers sat in couplers in the turret that always faced forward regardless of the position of the turret itself, which at least in theory was meant to keep them from getting disoriented. Both the German and American version of the tank could reach approximately 45 miles an hour or 70 kph compared to just 30 miles per hour or 48 kph. APH for most other Western tanks like M60s and Leopard 1s and the newer Soviet T62s. However, for the three-man crew crammed inside the claustrophobic fighting compartment, the ride was exceptionally smooth, and the tank's mobility and agility went a long way toward reducing the amount of time that they'd be subject to fire. For main armaments, MBT-70s featured stabilized 152mm XM150 guns capable of firing standard cannon rounds and shellar guided missiles. XM150s were improved long-barreled variants of the XM81s used on M551 Sheridan light tanks, and this ability to fire multiple munition types would have given MBTs a huge advantage over the Soviet tanks that they'd likely face in combat. During the 1960s, the maximum effective ranges of most 100, 105, and 115mm meter tank guns was between 2,000 and 2,500 yards. XM-150 cannons had slightly longer ranges than their predecessors and could fire various ammunition types, including high-explosive, anti-personnel, and discarding sabot armor-piercing rounds, the latter of which used a new and far denser tungsten alloy that allowed projectiles to penetrate thicker armor at long ranges. Another new feature that turned out to be an Achilles heel was the caseless cannon ammunition. In other words, there was no metal case behind the projectile containing the propellant. Instead, the case itself was formed with hardened propellants that ignited when the round was fired. However, these rounds were vulnerable to moisture and prone to damage due to mishandling. Worse yet, uncombusted portions of the case left in the breach after firing could ignite the next round prematurely, causing a potentially catastrophic phenomenon known as cooking off. The complex autoloader was capable of handling both cannon rounds and shellar missiles, both of which were stored in vertically rotating magazines. But though the mechanism saved weight and eliminated the need for a dedicated loader, it was never deemed to be as reliable as an actual human being ramming rounds into the breach. Under optimal conditions, rate of fire was about 12 rounds per minute, and in the event of an autoloader malfunction, the crew could manually load the gun, though the rate of fire would drop to about 2 rounds per minute. The gun did have its drawbacks, but it was considered likely that on modern battlefields, armored engagements would take place at much longer ranges than the cannons were capable of firing. With their guided missile capability, MBT-70s could have destroyed enemy vehicles from as far away as 10,000 feet. That's about 3,000 meters. The secondary armament consisted of a remote-controlled 20mm auto cannon for use against aircraft, troops, structures, and lightly armored vehicles. However, the cannons proved so tedious that they were largely disregarded by crews. MBT-70s also had 30 caliber machine guns mounted coaxially alongside the main gun for close-in defense. All told, each vehicle would have carried approximately 42 cannon rounds, 6 Shillier missiles, and more than 3,000 rounds for the auto cannon and machine gun combined. MBT-70s were also equipped with 8 smoke grenades launchers, each of which contained two grenades that would have provided valuable concealment when the tanks were in particularly open, vulnerable areas.
The frontal portion of the MPD-70's hull and turret were protected by spaced armor consisting of multiple plates between 20 and 40 millimeters thick, the outermost of which was high-performance armor HPA developed in the United States in the mid-1960s. Though its composition was a highly guarded secret at the time, it's now known that in addition to steel, HPA contained 9% nickel and 4% cobalt, all of which were forged into a relatively light but tough alloy through a process known as vacuum arc remelting. Melting. The armor in the downward sloped portion of the upper hull was capable of shrugging off Soviet armor piercing Sabat rounds fired from as close as 800 yards. Inside, crews were separated from ammunition, the engine compartment in the rear, and the large multi layer rubber fuel tank in the front by a series of armored bulkheads in both the hull and turret. However, as aluminium was used for the engine compartment floor to save weight, MBT 70s would have been particularly vulnerable to mines, though they were equipped with polyethylene radiation shielding to protect crews against electromagnetic pulses and chemical biological and nuclear agents that could be in the atmosphere. Of the 14 hulls manufactured between 1965 and 1966, most would have been completed and ready for testing and evaluation until mid-1968, and by then the tank's future was far from certain. In fact, the program was nearly a year behind schedule, and additional delays were imminent by the time the Americans unveiled their new tank at the Association of the United States Army Headquarters in Washington, D.C. the following year. The Germans demonstrated their MBT-70 in Augsburg in front of journalists, politicians, military brass, and the general public. But during the event, the vehicle became inoperable after a hydraulic system malfunction sent thick plumes of white smoke billowing from hatches in the Holland turret. Nonetheless, after the event, German officials claimed that by 1972, MBT-70s would replace all M48 patterns that were then in service. However, over the next few years, the program ran into a number of difficulties, many of which stemmed from competing interests and requirements from both the German and American sides. Drivers increasingly complained about becoming severely disoriented while the turret was rotated, and more importantly, the gun-slash-missile system was turning out to be far more expensive and troublesome than expected. Eventually, Germany decided to scrap the XM-150 altogether and replace it with a 120mm smoothbore iron metal 120mm cannon, much like the one used on both Abrams and Leopard tanks today. In addition, as is often the case when developing tanks and armored vehicles, the MBT-70 was becoming heavier than initially anticipated. The increase from 50 to 54 tons meant that expensive and time-consuming redesigns were needed, but in the end, this was just one symptom of the real problems. That the project was too ambitious, relied too heavily on international cooperation, and incorporated too much untested technology. And then, then there was the cost. By 1970, the cost per unit estimates had increased fivefold. In addition, overall development costs were initially predicted to be around 80 million US dollars, but just a few years in, the project had already cost 303 US dollars, or about 2.4 billion today. West Germany alone ended up paying more than the whole project was supposed to cost in the first place. In America, the House Armed Services requested that funding for the project be suspended until comprehensive reviews from the Department of Defense and Government Accounting Office could be conducted. After each published its findings, it was determined that the program could continue, but on a much smaller scale. Government officials were ultimately persuaded by army leaders that the program had merit, but by then it was clear that both America and Germany would be better going their separate ways. Shortly after termination, Germany began developing the Kyler tank, which would later become the Leopard 2. Originally designated XM803 in the United States, work began on converting the existing MBT-70s into low-cost alternatives that utilized only American-made components. Congress hoped to drive the per-tank cost down significantly by switching to less expensive steel armor, using a conventional cannon, and simplifying or altogether eliminating the effective but unreliable suspension. General Motors received a $16.5 million, $130 million today contract to develop the tank in the summer of 1971. But despite these compromises, shortly into development, the XM803 design began to match the MBT-70 in complexity, delays, and cost overruns. In December of the same year, Congress officially canceled the program, appropriating $20 million US dollars, $165 million today for cancellation costs, and another $20 million for, you guessed it, another tank program. Thankfully, this last program would eventually lead to the development of the M1 Abrams main battle tanks, various variants of which have been in continuous service since 1980. 
According to many who worked on and oversaw the MBT-70 program, both at home and abroad, its cancellation was cause for celebration. Another often cited reason for the program's demise was that American auto manufacturers charged an exorbitant amount for their services, perhaps because during peacetime, defense-related work was such a small part of their overall business. In addition, the Americans claimed that the Germans were reluctant to share their technology and insisted on using domestically manufactured components, even when they were obviously inferior to the ones made in America. For their part, the Germans said the same of the Americans, and in the end, they were probably both right. Now the Germans and the Americans have their own main battle tanks, the Leopard and the M1 respectively. Since each was developed independently, if they don't fare well against adversaries in battle, the countries have no one to blame but themselves, and, well, perhaps that's the way it should be. Look, if you enjoyed today's video, there's another one you might like, which is about the biggest tank ever made. It's another video from this channel, obviously. I'm linking to it on the screen now. Please check it out, and thanks for watching.